thank you for having me here. I hope everyone is having a good time. I hope you found this to be an informative session or group of sessions. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak um, and see some of the patients in the audience that we see in clinic as well. Um, so I've been with the Cleveland Clinic now for about six years. My interests are in melanoma uh, and in uh, cancers of the GI tract. Um, and I split my time about half and half. Um, I did this talk and I find it's always kind of difficult. You know, we know what to say when the audience is all doctors. We talk about statistics, we talk about numbers, we show graphs. When you're talking to patients, you want to take a step back and explain things a little bit differently. So, you know, what I wanted to do in a very basic sense was just try to start to answer the question, what do we do if this cancer comes back? And just kind of talk about a few basic things and try to introduce how some of the therapies work and what the approaches that we have here uh, for anyone who walks in our door. So excuse me if it's too basic. Um, it's a new style of talking. So what I wanted to do uh, is talk to you a little bit about how cells talk. Um, I think this is important to understand how our therapies work. I think it will inform you uh, on how we distinguish our different types of treatments. Uh, we'll talk about the therapies that we have in terms of chemotherapies, uh, targeted drugs, as, as they're called, and therapies that modulate the way the um, immune system works. I'll talk about a few of the new drugs, uh, and I'll talk about our general um, approach to treatment. Now, you can't laugh at this slide. It took me a long time to make it. <laughs> I hope you're laughing with me on that one, not at me. So how do oncologists view cells? I mean, cells are very complicated structures. And I don't think any one person can tell you how any one cell works. In a general sense, the way we think of cells is that there are these small structures that are coated with these proteins on the surface. Now, cells can't see. They don't know they're, they, they, they don't know they're a cell, they don't know they're a cancer cell, or they don't know they're a normal cell. So how do they figure out where they are and what to do? And so what they have is this coating of proteins on the outer shell. And these are really these kind of green structures here. These are proteins on the outside of the cell. And basically what these structures do is they let them grab onto other cells, which would be pictured here. And they let them grab onto the scaffolding that helps, makes, helps make an organ what it is. And what I mean by that, if I just take a step back in terms of what this scaffolding is, if you took out, say, a heart and you washed out all of the cells, you would actually be left with something. There's a structure there. It's actually beautiful in a way. This structure is there and it does stuff. Cells, when they bind to it, use it as a zip code. It informs them of where they are and what to do. So do other cells. So. The other thing that cells talk to are these blue dots here, which are structures that are floating around. These are proteins, these are carbohydrates, these are things called cytokines. These are substances that are soluble that circulate. Uh, and they can bind on to these proteins on the surface of cells. And all these things help tell cells what to do. And that's what these arrows are. All these signals are transmitted down to the DNA of a cell and they tell the cell what to do. How does that signal get transmitted down? So basically, if the signal is just a cytokine or some substance on the outside of the cell, it binds to the protein on the surface, and then through a series of proteins that get turned on one by one, the signal is transmitted from the outside of the cell down to the DNA, okay? Protein turns on protein, turns on protein, turns on protein. Eventually, one of these goes into where the DNA is and will either turn on genes or turn them off. And by turning genes on or off, you basically change what a cell does. This will make sense in a minute. You'll see why I'm talking about this when I start talking about our therapies. And then one of the most basic things a cancer cell has to do is grow. And so what we have here is a signal on the far left, 
being transmitted down to the DNA of a cell, and it's telling the cell, replicate, grow. And so to do that, the first thing the cell has to do is it has to copy its DNA. Before it does anything else, it has to copy the DNA. And so it does that with this second cell in the middle, and then finally the two cells break, uh, break apart. And when you started with one, you end up with two. So how does this play into our therapies? And what are our therapy options? So there's chemotherapy. Now, everyone kind of knows about chemotherapy, at least in some way, shape, or form. It's been around for a long time. Chemotherapies, as we know them, predominantly work in the DNA in interfering with how cells replicate. So chemotherapy drugs, by and large, interfere with the cell's ability to replicate the DNA. The newer drugs that we have that have been around for, say, 10 or fewer years are targeted therapies. And what targeted therapies do, as their name implies, is they target something. So these, these drugs target the signal, and not any signal. We try to identify which signals tell cancer cells to grow, and we target those, and we interfere with those signals, and that can take place at any point in the pathway. And then finally, there's a new class of drugs. It's actually not that new. We've been doing this for years and years, but there's been an explosion in terms of the therapies that are available um, for therapies that modulate the way the immune system works. And this is over in the upper left-hand corner of the slide. Basically, these are therapies that don't actually have an effect on cancer cells. They don't do anything to them. What they do do is they influence the way cancer cells and immune cells interact. And they shift the balance in favor of our body's white blood cells fighting cancer cells. And these are the three ways that our therapies now, nowadays work, or at, least where, or at least where they work. So you can see why I did all the slides about the... So chemotherapy, just coming back to it, this is something that predominantly affects cell cycling by interfering with the replication of DNA, as we talked about. It really has its uh, origins from uh, mustard gas in the First World War. Many of these compounds are naturally uh, derived. Uh, they most commonly affect rapidly growing cells, and that's where we get a lot of the side effects, including things like hair loss. While it's curative for many cancers, uh, it doesn't work well in others. Tar so targeted drugs, again, are a broad category of drugs which are designed to work based on our understanding of how cancer cells work. Uh, they come in a variety of different forms, from antibodies to small molecules. Uh, they often target a signal pathway, uh, and they've really revolutionized the care of many cancers, including lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, certainly with kidney cancer, and they're beginning to with melanoma. Um, but these drugs, work well, but often not permanently. And then there's um, e um, e uh, immunotherapy. Um, it's actually not new, as I've said. It's been around for quite a while. We've used drugs like interleukin-2 and interferon in melanoma for uh, decades now. There's vaccine therapies. Uh, it's all based on the fact that our body looks for and destroys cancer cells and cancer cells go to great lengths to avoid that process. And there's been a lot of progress that has been made in this field in the past couple of years, actually probably the past decade. So while these drugs have very little effect on cancer cells, again, as I've said, they affect the way white blood cells see, uh, see them. Um, I think the bottom line with these drugs, I think what's interesting, it's the reason I really want to talk about them, is unlike targeted drugs, unlike chemotherapies, which may work, uh, and sometimes they work well, these drugs really have the potential to eradicate cancer cells. And I think when we all talk about having a cancer therapy that works, what most of us mean is works for years, works forever. And these therapies, um, while not perfect, can do that. And some people, when we talk about these drugs, are brave enough to use words like cure. So it's a very exciting thing.
So from melanoma, I think, as most of us know, most of the research is focused on the skin form of this disease. And skin melanoma is distinct in many ways from melanoma of the eye. So this makes uh, the extrapolation of what we've learned from skin melanoma to eye melanoma difficult. However, it's not impossible. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons that we've learned. Um, just to distinguish the two, when we talk about eye melanoma and we say, where does this tumor go? Where can it go if it comes back? Most of the time, if it comes back, it's going to be found in the liver. Uh, unlike the skin form, which can come back in almost any part of the body. So when we talk about treatments, many, many times, if we know there's a cancer that's likely to come back in an organ in one place, then we'll employ treatments that focus on that organ. It's things like surgery, uh, uh, radio, uh, radio frequency ablation, uh, therapies of that sort. Chemotherapy for both cancers has not been very effective, and so we've really started to focus for both cancers on targeted drugs and immunotherapy. So when we talk about targeted drugs in melanoma of the eye, um, one of the hot topics is uh, compounds that inhibit a protein called MEK, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. And when we talk about um, immunotherapies, we're talking about drugs that uh, work on substances called CTLA-4 and PD-1. Uh, and there's been a lot in the press about these drugs. So when we come back to MEC, MEC is part of a signaling cascade called the MAP kinase pathway. This pathway tells cells to grow. Uh, MEC is the third protein here that's turned on, at least in this diagram. It's not that simple in real life, but I think this picture kind of tells the point. And so, so selumetinib is a drug uh, that interferes with MEC function um, and has been studied in eye melanoma and has shown promise. And uh, we have a trial that should be op o uh, opening up here soon within the next month or so, which is investigating the, the use of this agent uh, in comparison to chemotherapy. But again, you block the pathway, you block the signal to grow. So selumetinib is an oral drug. Uh, it's not FDA. Uh, uh, um, it's not approved by the FDA at this point in time for the treatment of anything, but it's under uh, investigation in several cancer types. Um, I'll come back to side effects and things like, like, like that after the talk, it's something we can focus on at a later point. This um, is, this also took me quite a long time. Um, so this is a slide that's supposed to explain to some degree how the immune therapies work. So you've got two things here. On the left side, uh, you've got the lymph node, okay? And on the right side, there's the organ. And so for eye melanoma, the organ would be the liver. Here you've got the cancer cell. So what we'll start with is this gray cell here. This is a cell, we call it an APC, and it's always circulating. It's always looking for bad guys, if you will. It's looking for cancer cells and other things. When it finds one, it travels back to the lymph node. When it's in the lymph node, it shows this segment, this red protein, this red part of the cancer cell to a T cell, which is really the general of our white blood cell system. It shows it to it, and it says, here is something you need to know about. This is something that's not good. That signal by itself is not enough. It's not enough to turn the cell on, to tell it to actually go out and look for this substance. There's other molecules that have a say. And as I said, so there's CTLA-4, which is right here. If the APC shows the bad guy to the T cell, there's CD28 and there's CTLA4. CD28 will also talk with the APC, and if the signal looks like this is something that, yes, you want to go after this substance, that, that this is a foreign substance that you want to fight, then CD28 turns the T cell on, the T cell goes out to the organ, finds the cancer cell, 
And once again, the same thing takes place. CD28 will tell the T cell to fight the cancer cell, but PD1 will tell it not to. It puts the brakes on the white blood cell. Same as CTLA4, it puts the brakes on this cell. So both these substances, CTLA4 and PD1, put brakes on white blood cells. They inhibit it from fighting cancer cells. So this is where, it, where, it, where um, ipilimumab works. It's even hard for us to say. It binds to and interferes with the function of CTLA4. And what this does is it shifts the balance in favor of turning T cells on and telling them to go out and fight cancer cells. Likewise, uh, PD-1 drugs will turn PD-1 off and again, shift the balance in favor of fighting these cancer cells. These drugs work on their own. They work in combination. Um, and the field is gonna change, I think, pretty dramatically in the next year or so as more data comes available. So these are IV medicines. Uh, they're currently approved by the FDA for use in sequence, uh, but combination of these drugs appears very promising. Um, the side effects of these drugs uh, include things like rash and uh, diarrhea. There can be inflammation of the liver and some other things. But again, I think the take home point for these drugs is that they can really be a home run and um, they can really, really impact uh, the outcome of treatment for this type of cancer. So that's all fine, but what do we do? What do we do on a daily basis? So for patients who've been treated, they've either had surgery or radiation. Um, we follow them with an ultrasound on a regular basis, looking at the liver. If we see something that concerns us, we try to get a biopsy and we image the rest of the body. To, an to answer the question, if it's in the liver, is it anywhere else? If, if the tumor is predominantly in the liver, then we think about things like surgery or embolization, where you go in and you cut off the blood flow or you deliver a radioactive beads to the tumor. And there's people here who, uh, who can comment on that be uh, better than I. If it's in multiple sites, or these other therapies have not worked, or sometimes in combination with these therapies, then we'll use the list of drugs that we've just talked about. Uh, the MEK inhibitors right now would only, though, be um, available on a clinical trial. Well, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.